Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome everyone to module 8 and lecture 38. We are going to start a new topic today called cell biology. Uh, cell biology has been split into four parts. We'll be covering this particular topic. So these are some of the topics that we're going to cover today. The first one is the importance of being small and uh, the textbook describes it as the cellular advantage. So uh, you might say that why are bacteria and all of these organisms that are so small, they occupy such a prominent place in the uh, entire, uh, uh, if we think about the biodiversity of organisms, bacteria have an especially important role and they are perhaps the most biodiverse organisms that we know. So what is the advantage to them? Why are they able to survive for uh, both in terms of time and space. So we'll take a look at that. And then we come to prokaryotic cells. What are the different shapes and sizes that we see in the environment and the nature of cell membranes because that determines how they take in nutrients and how they excrete uh, waste into the environment. So let's start with the cellular advantage which is also uh, the importance of being small for these bacteria. Uh, so, what I have here is the, uh, a sort of illustration of a coxoid uh, cell. So, as you know, the coxoid, we'll come to more details about that later. But for uh, starting, just to get an idea of this, uh, uh, the nature of being small and how does it work. So, we're taking a sphere. We're assuming that our bacterial cell is a simple sphere. Now, we can make any assumption. You can say the radius is 1 micron. We can say it's 3 microns and 6 microns. So we have a comparison here of two different um, organisms. Uh, the radius in the first case is 3 microns and in the second case it is um, what you, in the second case it is 6 microns. So you have the surface area and the volume. In the first case they are equal and uh, you can do the derivation so 4 pi r square divided by 4 by 3 pi r cube and the ratio is equal to 3 by r and you can put it in terms of diameter as well now surface area divided by volume in the first case is 1 and in the second case the ratio is 0 0.5 so what does that mean if the organism is becoming bigger or is bigger then the surface area by volume ratio is less so is there an advantage in being small the answer is yes because this ratio surface area to volume ratio is smaller as the radii goes down the surface area to volume ratio is increasing so the smaller the cell the greater the surface area and it is the surface area that brings in nutrients and excretes waste. So remember they don't feed like us, we feed by ingestion, we have only one inlet and that is our mouth. So whatever, whether it's water, whether it's food, it goes in through only one, in, uh, one inlet. And the bacteria on the other hand don't feed by ingestion, what we do is ingestion. And what the bacteria are doing is what is called absorption and absorption is a surface phenomenon. So the entire surface area is available for the bacteria to feed and get nutrients. So this surface area by volume ratio is crucial and that is what determines 
the ability of the bacteria to get what it needs from the environment. So here you have as the radii goes down the surface area by volume ratio which is also called specific surface area in engineering that will increase. So as R decreases S by V or the specific surface area increases and that is why the smaller the size of the, uh, the cell, the greater the advantage in absorbing nutrients and that is what the bacterial advantage or the cellular advantage is all about. So, this like I said the impact of size on nutrient absorption, waste excretion and motility. Now, small is better for the simple reason that it is a small uh, volume as well as surface area, they are able to move in their environment more conveniently because they are small. I think the best uh, example would be try driving a small car versus a big car in a congested city. You know that a small car has an advantage, it can park in places where a big car cannot park, right? So that is a little bit about the motility of bacteria as well. So then we have nutrient absorption and waste excretion, so we have already understood that part. What is the impact of this advantage? The first impact is if the organism is small, it needs less nutrients. That is one thing. It has a greater surface area to volume ratio and that means it needs and is able to absorb a lot and that will result in rapid growth rates. So if the nutrients in the environment are available, the growth rate is very rapid and this will result in large population sizes. So if you think about wastewater, municipal wastewater, it has millions to billions of cells per ml. Okay, So imagine the number of cells that are able to exist on the nutrient available in the wastewater. So the population sizes are uh, very, very large and they have a very strong impact on the ecosystems. But because Anytime you have bacteria or any other small organisms, their impact on ecosystems is enormous. So they are a very significant part and portion, uh, fraction of the total biomass in any ecosystem. And you know from ecology that um, they can be primary producers and they are all, many of them are decomposers. So they are the beginning and end of every food chain. So you know how uh, enormous the impact of these prokaryotes especially is on the environment as well as any ecosystem. Let us take a little uh, closer look at the motility of cells. How do they move? Um, we will take a look at the method of movement and that is the flagella. We are not going to go there right now. We are going to take an engineering perspective on uh, the way cells move in their environment. Um, so what we have here are a few um, important data. Okay, So I have with, it is very easy to find this data. You can look at it in any uh, textbook or in my case I took this data from the internet. So we can assume that the bacteria have a diameter of let us say 2 microns and a length of 5 microns. We have whales which are the other end of the size spectrum. So if you think about the largest animal on the planet, especially animals that live in aquatic systems, the largest animal is the blue whale and it has a diameter of about 2.5 meters and a length of about 20. 5 meters. How do human beings compare with these two uh, organisms? First of all, we do not live in water. We can only swim. We do have the ability to swim, but we cannot survive in water. So that is one major difference. The diameter is right in between. So we have 0 0.5 meters diameter, assuming that we are elongated cylinders. and this is a very simplistic way of, you know, we do this in engineering all the time. So we are following the same ideas. And the length is about, let us say, 1.7 meters. For doing these calculations, we are going to assume that each one of these organisms is a cylinder with the diameter and the length that is shown over here. So I can measure my ability to cover distance while I am swimming. So if I am swimming, I know how much distance I can cover in 
a few seconds or minutes and so on, right? We can convert that to body length because that will put it on a relative scale. So I can measure it in meters per second or I can measure it in body length per second to put it on a relative scale. So when you have a bacteria, you have microns. When you have whales, you have a few meters. So we see that humans have a length of uh, more than one meter. So that is uh, just to give us a sense of relative speed. Okay. So that is one parameter that is calculated over here. The next uh, parameter that we're calculating is based on Reynolds number. So those of you who are from civil engineering or any of the other engineering branches, you may be knowing about Reynolds number. So Reynolds number is abbreviated as RE or NR, depending on what source you're looking at. It is a unitless number and it is the ratio of inertial forces divided by viscous forces. So the inertial forces are uh, shown by rho Vd. Rho is the density of the object, V is the uh, velocity of the object and D is the diameter of the object. Divide that by mu and mu is the fluid viscosity in grams per second per meter. I can calculate, so based on these dimensions, as well as assuming uh, the viscosity. So I have assumed a viscosity of 10 to the power minus 3 Newton second per meter square has been converted and we have a maximum speed. So let us say the maximum speed of bacteria is 100 microns per second. For a whale, it's 30 kilometers per hour and for a human being, it's 2.3 meters per second. I can convert that to body length because I know the length of the organism. So if I want to compare how fast does these, how fast do these organisms move, you can see that the bacteria is moving 20 body lengths per second. So just imagine that it is faster on a relative scale, it's much, much faster than a whale or a human being and we normally think about whales as being able to move very fast in water. So you can get a sense of comparison here. You can convert it into velocities. Now from a, if you just put it in terms of meters per second, it's not much. Obviously they're very tiny organisms and they're not even visible to the eye. So it's not much in terms of meters per second, but on a relative scale, because you cannot compare a micron sized organism with a 2.5 meter long um, or a 2.5 meter diameter whale. So you have to give it a sense of relativity which the body length per second gives you. I've already mentioned the diameter, the density of all organisms in this case for simplistic reasons has been assumed to be the same. Look at the Reynolds numbers. What does the Reynolds number tell us? The Reynolds number tells us the ratio of inertial forces to viscous forces. So if the bacteria has less than one as the Reynolds number and the other two organisms, humans and whales, have far greater than one as their Reynolds number. What that means is that the bacteria are dominated by, or rather the movement of bacteria is dominated by viscous forces. So the analogy that people often use is of human beings swimming in a tank of sugar syrup. So imagine that you are dumped into a tank of sugar syrup and you have to swim in it. That's when viscosity will dominate, right? So for the bacteria, swimming is similar, to, swimming in water is similar to that. So we have high viscosity and we have uh, high inertial forces for whales and human beings. Now, um, what difference does that make? Why am I going into this? So this was all about the cellular advantage. This is not really an advantage. This is the cellular disadvantage. So if you know swimming, you know that um, when you go swimming, what do you often do? You take a kick off the wall, right? So when you start swimming, you take an initial kick that allows you to cover a huge amount of distance before you start paddling and moving your arms and so on, right? So that is 
because inertia dominates. So you get a momentum, you get that initial momentum from the kick of the wall and that allows us to coast or cruise while we are swimming. And what does the whale do? It just flips its tail a few times and it gets an enormous amount of momentum simply by doing that, right? So these are two organisms that get an enormous, uh, or rather I'll put it another way, they are able to cover enormous distances in the water simply because of this inertial uh, forces okay now the poor bacteria do not have an advantage in this case for them because viscosity dominates because of their small size it's the viscosity that rules and that is evident over here now this like I said is the opposite of the cellular advantage they are able to get their nutrients but movement is difficult and movement when they do have to do it is generally in response to a requirement for nutrients okay so they do have to move in response to their requirement for food that is one thing and the second thing is they have to utilize a huge amount of energy to get to their food and that is the literally the conclusion from this entire exercise is to show you how difficult it is for these bacteria to get their food they expend a lot of energy before they are able to derive energy let's come to their shapes and sizes so here we have a huge bunch of prokaryotic cells you as i already mentioned quite a few times that bacteria are the most biodiverse um, organisms that are known and uh, part of it is because they are so small so that is also part of the cellular advantage and I should also mention over here that they are also the most primitive organisms on the planet so when we talk about the beginning of life uh, most of us agree I think without any debate that all life is likely to have begun with prokaryotic cells they are the simplest life forms that continue to exist right from the day that life began on the planet so let us start with the size shape and arrangement of cells we all know I think most of you have uh, again studied in high school that bacteria are if you have the single cell which is capable of living on its own and then when it reproduces it reproduces by binary fission so that single parent cell becomes two daughter cells and those two daughter cells are now the parent cells and they become four daughter cells and so on and that's how the bacteria continue to uh, reproduce so if you have cocci similar to this particular species staphylococcus aureus and you, let's imagine that we have a single coxoid cell if it reproduces and it reproduces in one plane just like a line so a line is your one dimensional reproduction and this particular coxoid has split into two so it's a diplococci if it continues to split but it continues to form a chain and then it's called streptococci okay so streptococci is a long chain of coxoid cells they are all independent if you split one of the cells away from the chain it will uh, live independently it will continue to reproduce and go through the same phenomenon all over again uh, then we have supposing it uh, starts reproducing in two directions so let's say we have a single cell and it is reproducing in let's say x and y directions okay so up to diplococci and streptococci let's say it's in one direction so x direction in the tetrad you have a single cell it's reproducing in both directions so first it becomes two and then it becomes four so this becomes a tetrad and that is two dimensional so that's why i've said cocci can divide in three planes all three planes x y and z planes if it divides in all three planes we call it sarcina and if it continues to divide over a long period of time but the cells don't break away okay so if the cells don't break away they, they 
uh, create what is called staphylococci. So this becomes after a small amount of time, a few generations, this becomes staphylococci because you, it, you get an amorphous mass of cells. Uh, it's a cluster of cells and they have divided in all three directions. So you get this amorphous mass. Bacilli are slightly different. They are rod shaped bacteria. So here we have bacilli species. You can see they are all elongated rod shaped uh, bacteria. So this is a single bacillus. If it divides in one direction, you get diplobacilli. If it continues to divide in the same direction, forming this long chain or filament, you get streptobacilli, same nomenclature. And coxobacilli are slightly different. They are uh, not so elongated. So they are more like um, a spherical shape but slightly oblong almost like an egg shape okay so these are coxobacillus uh, organisms then we have some more interesting forms so the next one is uh, vibrio vibrio which is very famous for being vibrio cholerae it causes cholera it's a comma shaped we used to call it a comma shaped um, organism so this is an example of vibrio so here we have Vibrio cholerae in uh, SEM. Uh, this is, yeah, I think it's an SEM. And then we have spirulum. Now the entire body of the bacteria is slightly uh, helix shaped. So you can see spirulum and spirochete. So you can see the nature of these two um, species. So you have spirulum here. You can see the wavy type of um, body that it has. And spirochete is slightly helical. In nature and here's another image of another helical um, uh, organism uh, Borrelia species right so having seen the sizes and shapes of the different types of prokaryotic cells we now come to another issue and that is the structures that are internal to the cell so we will take a look at the cell wall later but we are going to start with the cytoplasmic membrane or the plasma membrane. So the first thing we are going to take a look at is how is the plasma membrane formed? What are the building blocks of the plasma membrane? So I think I mentioned this when I was talking about the uh, monomers of fatty acids going to lipids and we saw what simple lipids like triglycerides look like and we looked at complex lipids like phospholipids and glycolipids, sulfolipids, all of that. These phospholipids, sulfolipids, glycolipids, these are the building blocks of the plasma membrane. And we've already seen, so this is the first thing, cell membranes are made out of phospholipids and phospholipids is true for bacteria remember that bacteria the domain bacteria applies to modern bacteria the ones that you see in your normal environment archaea bacteria have sulfolipids and glycolipids which we will come to later they all have fatty acids so we have our glycerol molecule and it has three fatty acids you can see these long chain fatty acids in this particular graphic and there, these fatty acids are linked to the glycerol by ester linkages. So these are some of the fatty acids that can be part of the plasma membranes. And they all vary in terms of the number of carbons in each of these fatty acids. They vary from C16 to uh, C18 or even more. Yeah. Uh, more examples of these um, uh, phospholipids as well as glycolipids. So here you have examples of phospholipids as well as glycolipids. I'm not going to go into any detail. I don't expect anyone to uh, memorize all these things. This is just to impress you with the fact that they all have this structure. So you have this glycerol which has these long chain fatty acids attached to it just like it's shown over here. These are the long chains of the um, phospholipids and glycolipids. An important point which I think I mentioned in the previous topic is the difference between bacteria and archaeobacteria. So remember these are the three domains of the uh, of all living organisms. Two of them are occupied by prokaryotes and it's only the third domain that is the eukaryotes. Now why are bacteria and archaea 
so different and that is mainly because the plasma membrane has um, it, it is different from all the other plasma membranes so to put it another way bacteria and eukaryotes have similar plasma membranes where these triglycerides are the same structure so they have the same ester linkages archaeobacteria on the other hand which I have been saying for quite some time, which go back to a long time in the evolutionary past of living organisms, they have ether linkages. So that is used as a biomarker to separate archaeobacteria from bacteria. And so when I was talking initially in the very first lecture, I said bacteria serve as a tool for understanding life processes as well as evolution okay so when we talk about the evolution of life on the uh, planet and why are we this way we are etc etc all these things these are the tools that we use for probing life processes and this is something that like i said tells us a great deal about how life began when it did which was 3.5 billion years or even more further back, 3.5 to 3.9 billion years ago is when uh, prokaryotes probably uh, were born on the planet and uh, eukaryotes are very new comparatively speaking. They are about two to two and a half mil billion years ago and human beings are very new entries on the planet. They're very, very new compared to all these organisms. But the important point for going off on this tangent, because even though it doesn't seem to have anything to do with environmental microbiology, it really does for the simple reason, and I keep saying this again and again, life began when there was no oxygen on the planet. So our current understanding is that there was no oxygen, it was very high temperature and fairly uh, low pH, uh, conditions under which life began and uh, these archaeobacteria are probably uh, organisms that date back to those times under which life began because they are extremophiles and they are capable of surviving in the harsh conditions under which life began and the modern bacteria and ourselves and other higher organisms that are dependent on oxygen are a different branch of this evolutionary uh, process. So that's why these are quite interesting and remember that organisms modify their environment and this is the best example of that. Oxygen on the planet has come mainly from algae. Okay, So it's the phytoplankton that have contributed the greatest amount of oxygen to the planet and um, it's, it's because of this biotic, abiotic um, give and take let's call it uh, the give and take between the biotic part of the environment and the abiotic part, it's important to remember that today's environment has been formed by these organisms or their predecessors and these predecessors themselves have created new environments. So it does have a lot of uh, importance from at least a scientific point of view. Uh, so, before I uh, go to permeability, let me show you the structure of these plasma membranes. Now, that is also a very interesting structure. I've already mentioned to you in the previous topic in cell chemistry, I'm sorry, um, yes. Uh, so, I already mentioned to you that these phospholipids, glycolipids, sulfolipids, all of them are amphipathic molecules. Amphipathic means one side, this side which has oxygen is hydrophilic and the other side which has the fatty chains, these fatty chains have no oxygen, they are only carbon and hydrogen, they are hydrophobic. Okay, So we call this the head and these are the tails. So every molecule has this one head, the glycerol, and three tails, three or two tails, minimum two more, uh, or three tails, okay. Now because one is, because the head is hydrophilic and the tails are hydrophobic, you get this automatic, spontaneous, orderly arrangement of these molecules will happen in water. It's like oil and water, literally like oil and water. What happens when you add a little bit of oil to water under room temperature? 
it will form a layer of oil at the top because oil and water don't mix. So oil is hydrophobic and water is water. So okay, so they don't mix and you get this layer. Now here we have similar compounds. We have something that likes to be in water and we have something that does not like water. It dislikes water. So all the tails will cluster together and the heads will move towards the water. We are in an aquatic environment. So in an aquatic environment, all heads move towards water, all tails are in between. So you literally get this sandwich layer in the, bit, uh, in the middle of the hydrophilic layers. So you have hydrophilic, hydrophobic, hydrophilic. And this, this entire layer is not bonded together. This is a simple and uh, perhaps the best example of hydrophobic interactions, which I again talked about in the previous chapter. So when I was talking about weak interactions like van der Waals forces, hydrogen bonds and so on, hydrophobic interactions are the crux of the matter for plasma membranes. So you see this bilayer membrane. So this bilayer membrane is for literally an oil layer surrounded by water layers at the two sides. So that's how. Now imagine to some Imagine any compound trying to pass through this layer. Not possible, right? Because you have hydrophilic, you have hydrophobic. So any compound that is hydrophilic cannot pass through the hydrophobic layer. And any compound that is hydrophobic cannot pass through the hydrophilic layer. So from a practical standpoint, this plasma membrane without any bonds is a perfectly impermeable layer. Okay, and that's how the bacterial cell maintains its integrity. It's a fragile, just imagine how fragile it is because it doesn't have any bonds. None of the molecules are bonded together. But because of the nature of the molecules, they have created an orderly arrangement. And this orderly arrangement is what prevents anything from going in or out without a protein or uh, without a protein to help in the process. So the plasma membrane, truly speaking, is a semi-permeable membrane for this reason. So if you have just the plasma bilayer or the, phosph um, the phospholipid bilayer, if you have only that, then it's perfectly impermeable because nothing will get through. However, the cell needs to pick up nutrients and it needs to throw out waste. So it's doing it somehow. How is it doing it is because of this. So it has pores, it has channel proteins, you have transmembrane proteins, you have uh, proteins that are um, on one side of the membrane. All these things are what allows nutrients to come in and waste to be excreted into the environment. So that is the entirety of the structure of the plasma membrane. So you can see how incredible it is literally. And uh, more proof of permeability. So if I put the permeability of different compounds on a scale relative to water and we assume that water can pass in and out, which again is not entirely true, even though some textbooks do have that. Uh, we know by now, and I think I mentioned that in the milestones, and somebody has been awarded um, the Nobel Prize for uh, showing us that aquaporins or these uh, proteins have been um, have been discovered, and their role in uh, the permeability of membranes is that it's these proteins are the ones that allow water even to come in and out. Even water is not going to pass freely. Okay, so you look at all the other compounds. How do, how well do they pass through the membrane in comparison to water? So water is given a hundred, just to give a relative scale. Glycerol is zero point one, which means one thousand times less permeability compared to water. Glucose is even less than that, so that is ten to the power. You can do it yourself. So 10 to the power minus 5 times. For chloride, it's 10 to the power minus 8 because here we have 10 to the power minus 6. We divide it further by 100 and that gives us uh, an idea that chloride ion is 10 to the power minus 8 times less permeable than water. And similarly, 
For the potassium ion, it would be 10 to the mi power minus 9 and for sodium, it would be 10 to the power minus 10. So, that's how impermeable the membrane is to almost everything, okay. So, it's relatively impermeable and it becomes permeable only because of these transmembrane proteins and we will be taking a good look at some of the processes and the transmembrane proteins that determine the processes that happen in and at the membrane because this membrane is not for protection of the cell this is too fragile a structure to protect the cell it is in fact the site of ATP synthesis for the bacterial cell so this is this is not protection cell wall is for protection we will come to that in the next uh, topic but for now it is sufficient for you to know that the cell membrane exists solely for mediating the transport of nutrients and waste products in and out of the cell this is the barrier that determines what goes in and what goes out and it's the proteins that span the membrane that determine this.